perfectionist? No, not necessarily, but I'm, I'm realistic on what it takes to achieve a goal. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not necessarily caught up on the perfection of it. I, I guess that's a, the, it's inevitable, but even something like audio engineering where there's not, there's not a set way to do it. I think, and that was a hard thing too. Like, you know, when it comes to drumming, okay, well, if we practice this and we hold the stick this way and we focus on using our wrist, this is a technique that we can do to develop our wrist so that we can, you know, or this is how we make our double stroke roll faster. This is how we properly execute a flam and have consistency. You can do that. You can't do that with audio engineering. You know, you can't say this is how you EQ a vocal. Right. This is how you compress. This is how you compress a guitar. You know, it, because it, everything is different all the time. And that's and, and dependent on all the other instruments right. in the mix as 100%. well. 100%. It's everything is organic. The mix is organic. So with that being said, I've given up on things being perfect. I just understand, you know, when it comes to starting something new, like at what level do I want to do it at? And is it realistic? And I guess maybe for me, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist, but I do kind of have like a conquer mentality. So mm -hmm. when I want something, I fixate on it for maybe 10 years. So 10 years, it was all marching band, you know? Yeah. And I got to, in the lane that I chose, the highest level that you can get to in it. Not, not only was it, we were a competitive, you know, top tier HBCU drum line, but I was also captain of the drum line. You know, I wrote the majority of the cadence with, with some other people, but I, I wrote the majority, even almost maybe the majority of the things they still play today. I probably, they still probably play half the repertoire of something that I wrote you know, 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah. So like those things are, are, you know, cool. But once I'm done with it, I'm done. Just same thing like with audio, like I'm doing audio, I've done audio the past, um, heavily the past 15 years, you know, and I've kind of, my, my goal in audio was to, um, have a gold record. I was like, Hey man, if I can just get a gold record, I know I, I, I did something. I know I was good enough, you know, and mm -hmm. I hit that pinnacle early on, I think 2016, and, you know, then it was Platinums, then it was other stuff, then working on Grammy-nominated projects, then we're working on, you know, then oh, I mixed a, fully mixed a number one album. And, you know, so it's like, it started out as engineering and then just, you know, or beat making. I was doing a lot of production, so I like that. And then from production, it shifted to, um, I want to make this sound how it sounds on the radio. Like, how do they get it to sound that way? And then I dove down that engineering rabbit hole. I still have some more story. Can I pick back up where I left off? And no, yeah, I yeah. Off I was going to say, there's something in between, right? We, right, we, right? we missed something in between, like you got burnt out of, of drumming right. and then you decided to pivot into engineering. Okay, so. What was that? North Carolina Central, I was still there. And I got into, I was making beats. And at the time, mm. You know, there wasn't like access to home studios and all that stuff. Um, there wasn't access. We didn't have the access to like the high-end keyboards and things like that. Uh, so I, I had got Logic one year. I got a computer for Christmas and, lot, and, I, and I had Logic on it. And so I was making these really cool beats. And um, I guess I was maybe, I don't know if people weren't rapping or singing on them. Or was, maybe they just didn't have a place to do it. But it's either one or the other. Like either I wasn't able to seal the deal when they weren't there for them to use wherever they were going to record. I, I couldn't get them to, to get on my tracks. So I was like, well, I'll provide, you know, I'll get a microphone. And I, I bought a microphone and I bought a, a little mixer from somebody that um, I could run into. And I had a cheap like DigiDesign interface um, or some kind of, it was as cheap as you could get it. And like one of the early inboxes or something. Yeah, I don't, well, I don't even know because I was on Logic, so it wasn't an inbox. But it was something where I could record, you know, it had some sort of converter in it, you know? And so I would come yeah. out of this, this little two-channel mixer, but I used that two-channel mixer because it had phantom power. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd paid like 50 bucks for this mic and this mixer from a random person. And, um, <laughs> and so, but it, but it was a way that I could get the people you know, my friends or the people I knew that rapped to actually rap on my beats, you know? And in yeah. turn, while I was getting people to rap on my beat, I got real heavy into sampling. Um, I was a good beat maker. I mean, I understood rhythms. I understood all these tempos. I understood right. 
you know, uh, music, you know, I was a music major for four or five years. So I knew theory. I knew, you know, the practical application of it. I knew how to play piano at that time, at least producer play it. So the missing link was, okay, well, we, we need to record. Well, I was recording something and I'm like, okay, this sounds terrible. What do we do? And then I dove down that hole, you know, I got burnt out on marching band. It, it was over anyways. Like it was after the fall semester of my last year, I was like, I, look, I'm not marching another season. So I, I kind of dived into engineering and I got better and better at it, but it was still bad. It was still terrible. And, um, and there was a studio uptown or, or downtown Durham. It was called Flavor Fruit and it was owned by a guy named Skaz. Um, Skaz was Big Daddy Kane's road DJ. So the, the, you know, the famous rapper from New York, Big Daddy Kane, um, this guy owned it. Skaz is a really awesome dude too. Super nice, always patient with me. And I remember the first time I went out there, he was, Mm -hmm. oh no, I went up there with someone that would record there and someone that used to be in the marching band. He was older. Um, and he would go up there and record. And I was like, Hey, can you please take me? Like, can I please meet them? And he took me up there and I played some beats for him. And they're like, Oh man, these are really good. Like, I like these a lot. I'm like, okay, awesome. Um, you know, can I come back? Can I just be around? Can I do anything? And they're like, yeah, do you, you want to come, you can come do stuff here, you know, if you want to come help. And I was like, okay, cool. And remember, this is at the time where like, I still think at this time, I, I still didn't even have text messaging on my phone. So he was like, I usually come up here at nine in the morning. So I came up there. And at the time, downtown Durham wasn't like a super safe place. It's not like uh, how these downtown places are now. Um, when they've been gentrified and everything moved away, this was kind of pre that. So, you know, it was a little rough where, where we were at. And so I just sat down and I waited outside, you know, I got there at eight 30. He didn't come to, I think 11 the first day he got, he's like, Oh man, you, um, I didn't know. I didn't think he'd be back. I was like, yeah, man, I told you I'd be back. I was excited. He's like, Oh, you were you out here long. I was like, no, not that long. He's like, okay, cool. Come in. So we went upstairs. I stayed there for like eight <laughs> or nine hours. And we were doing stuff. He's like, let me see what you can do, you know? And I had already known, I already knew how to use Pro Tools. I actually went to Harris with my mom, the Cherokee Casino. And uh, she gave me a hundred dollars. And she's like, here, just gamble it, whatever. I ended up winning like six, 700 bucks. And I bought an wow. inbox and I was using <laughs> Pro Tools 7 at the time. But I'd got like, you know, like a, a small inbox. It, it was like the smallest inbox that they make. Not the little blue uh, dongle thing they had, but it was like a silver, it was made for, it was like a light version, like Pro Tools Light or something. So I, I had got my feet with, I, I understood Logic, I understood DAWs. So I got Logic, I went to the studio and I actually knew how to move around and, and could do stuff. And he's like, oh, okay, cool, we'll check this out. So he, there he had NPCs, he had a Triton. He's like, this is how you make beats on these. And I was like, oh, awesome. So I jumped right in and I just started making beats the way he showed me, you know, but using the NPC as a sequencer and I got really, I liked that a lot. I was like, oh, this is super cool. And, um, and then, so that was the first day. And then the next day I came back and I did the same thing. It took him a couple hours to get there. And he was like, how long have you been out here? And I'm like, I don't know, not that long. He's like, for real, how long have you been? I'm like, two hours. He's like, just take my number down. If you're going to be up here every day, just call me and I'll let you know if I'm at the studio or not. Because the campus where I lived was only five minutes from the studio, you know? So it was nothing whenever he was ready to come, he would just let me know. Um, so that started there. And then I never uh, got to engineer any sessions. I just hung around and I was making a lot of beats. So I started like a little beat production group with him and another guy. And we would, you know, work on getting placements and everything. And they didn't never really get a placement. But I learned a lot about beat making with them, a lot about sampling. Um, I picked up some good engineering tips. I picked up some bad engineering tips from him because Skaz was mainly a producer. But at the time, like, I remember like we'd record tracks and he'd have like a preset um, audio suite compressor, like the Dyn3 from, from Avid or uh, DigiDesign or whatever. And he would just highlight the, the vocal and then audio suite the compression on there. And so I was doing that. I didn't, you know, I didn't know it's any like better. like baking it in. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, committing it essentially. Um, yeah. But yeah. at the same time, I learned how audio suite worked that way. You know, and Skaz right. never claimed to be like, oh, I'm this great mixer or I'm this great this or that. Like he wanted to be a producer. He was a DJ. He understood music. He knew good music. Hey everyone, let me tell you about a fantastic tool every recording studio should be using if they want their portfolio to sound the best it possibly can. It's the new FilePass lossless portfolio player, which can be embedded on whatever website builder you're already using. 
Instead of lossy players like Spotify, SoundCloud, or whatever audio player is built into your website, the FilePass Portfolio Player is 100% lossless, meaning it streams full quality WAV files so your work sounds exactly like it should. It also includes analytics so you can keep up with how many streams each song on your portfolio is getting. If you want to add the FilePass lossless portfolio player to your website, you can get 20% off your first year by going to filepass.com slash secretsonics. Again, the special URL for Secretsonics listeners to get 20% off your first year of the FilePass player is filepass.com slash secretsonics. And there's a link in the show notes below. So go check it out. All right, back to the episode. So, but you know, that was the first opportunity that I got and I was super thankful. And when I was, I was there maybe six months and I was coming up on summertime and I had a friend that was like, well, I want to go to Full Sail in Florida. And I was like, well, what's that? He's like, oh, it's this big production school. So they sold me this dream. This dream. I looked it up. I was like, oh, I have to go there. And my whole reasoning behind it was nobody's coming through Durham right now. Nobody was coming through Charlotte. I'm like, well, at least if I go to Full Sail, maybe that'll allow me to get a job in LA or New York or Atlanta where I can- Maybe make a living yeah. doing this. Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking of living because I've always thought like things will work out. Like that's always been my mentality. Um, oh, that's I I I I, w- I wish I had that same mentality. Yeah. That's great. I mean, it definitely it early you know in my life it's got not got me in trouble, but it has given me given me the false sense of confidence to take risks that did pay off. Whereas mm-hmm. if I had any sense to me, I would have never done that. Yeah, but yeah, it worked. It makes a lot of sense. It worked, and but not everything has worked. So you know that's that's humbling too. But um, I was always like I always had the mentality, especially pre. Um, when I had the the issues with the anxiety pre leading up to that, um, you couldn't tell me anything. I would I could run till my heart popped, you know. Like I would I could push myself beyond anything if I wanted to do it. If I didn't want to do it, it got zero effort from me. So, mm-hmm. or I figured out some way around it. Like I figured out a way to kind of like cheat the system. Like school, I didn't like school, but I got good grades. I knew I could take tests well, and I was smart but I didn't really like going to class. So like I wouldn't skip school, but I'd figure out a ways to get around going to the classes that I was, yeah, yeah. you know, stuff like that. <laughs> figure out how you. to talk, yeah. figure out how far I could push the teacher until they wouldn't let me make something up or when, you know, like this, I, I, I would test boundaries a lot anyways uh, with myself and, and with other things, but it was always very, um, I don't know what's the best way to put it. Like it was in a, it was in a nice way. It was in a polite way. It was well-intentioned. May, yeah. I mean, for myself, you know, uh, or for my free time or whatever. But yeah, it was never to be malicious. It was like, well, let me figure out how to do what I want to do. What do I have to do to do what I want to do? And um, and that's kind of how all this was. And that same thing with Full Sail. It's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to go here, you know, and learn how real big studios, because I knew it wasn't like a huge studio, but there also wasn't any big studios in the area. You know, so I'm like, it wasn't like I could say, okay, well, I'm going to graduate and go to this studio. There was, I think, uh, Osceola or something was in Raleigh, but that was too far. And I remember, um, I never met the owner, but somebody that I knew said that they didn't like them. And at the time I was like, okay, well then I don't like them either, you know? And, uh, which was completely stupid. I'm sure he's a cool dude or whoever he was. I'm sure he's fine. And, um, yeah. but I was kind of like, nah, you know, uh, and, uh, just a, a dumb college kid. So anyway, so I go to Full Sail and my buddy that wanted to go, he wasn't able to get in. He wasn't able to get the loan, get a loan for it. And um, so that, that was kind of weird. And at the time I was like super serious with a girl, um, just like in love. It was actually my first time being in love, like having real love feelings. And I was with her for a little over a year. I was like, she didn't want to stay together if I left. And I'm like, damn, that sucks really bad because I like, I love you. You know, I, I want to marry you. I, I want to have kids with you. And at the time, I think I was 24 at the time and she stepped away. turns out she was cheating on me, but you know, oh, uh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. You know what I mean? It, it's a, it's a blessing. Uh, it was a blessing at the time, but it was really, really hard for me to deal with that, that part of it too. So I go to full cell and, uh, everything's cool and I'm hoping to meet some cool people down there. And I, and I do, but I, I treat it like kind of how I was treating like a marching band mentality, like. I'm dope at this. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to show you. And I was hoping everybody else was there. And there wasn't. There was maybe like two or three people that were decent. Like my buddy, uh, Jonathan Weaver. He was a really good artist. He knew engineering. He was a great singer. He was a good producer. And he was a church musician. Um, and he partied like I did. So he liked to drink and stuff. And like, we like, we got along. That was my homie. Um, but 
Um, everybody else, you know, there's a couple people that did okay stuff, but I really didn't find anybody that was even at the level that I was at. So it was easy for me to come in and 